Hey, what's up everyone and happy game week. It is Monday, of course, so we have our regular scheduled Ask Mike segment. Mike, are we talking a lot of football this week? I think it's almost all football in one way Love or another. Love it. <laughs> all right. Well, I mean, one of the hot topics right now is there's apparently been a hike in ticket prices. For baseball. For baseball. So we'll start off with the Diamond Hogs before we jump into all the football stuff. But that has strange pork a little bit concerned. So our first question says, do you think it is wise with the new donation levels pushing out longtime loyal season ticket holders, no matter how much they talk about one Razorback, those suits just want the money. I feel sorry for DBH and the team when the crowds are not as big, loud, and loyal in the future. Wow. Very complicated issue. Yeah. Uh, basically what the athletic department is doing mm -hmm. is business. Right. What's the supply and demand? Yeah. If your product is better, people should pay more money for it. That, of course. That's true. How many times has, how a, it works. has a new automobile come out and everybody wants it and yeah. you can't get one? <laughs> you got to pay above sticker price to yep. get it. Uh, if houses are hard to come by at any particular time, mm -hmm. you go and you make an offer and, the, and then two or three other people have made more offers and yeah, all of a sudden you gave the, the asking price, but people were willing to go way over the asking yeah. price. So that's supply and demand. What on the other side of this issue, and, and here's what we don't know. We don't know how many of these season ticket holders, longtime season ticket holders, are going to do what they say they're going to do. Right. Which is, they say they're out. Mm -hmm. You've disrespected us. We've been season ticket holders for 20 years or whatever. Yeah. We're the core of what Bomb Stadium always was. <laughs> We started all the traditions that are there, yeah. that little chicken dance thing. Oh, that yeah, you the see. chicken dance. They started all that <laughs> stuff. And there's no question that Bomb has some, some qualities about it that as I go around the SEC, it's a better atmosphere. I think they're oh, smarter I fans. I agree. I mean, how many times have you gone to Ole Miss? And Ole Miss is loud, but it's annoying. Their fans are <laughs> annoying, they say stupid things. South Carolina, they let their students get right up behind the dugout, uh -huh. which is a bad idea. Uh, I think uh, Tennessee, again, kind of an annoying place. You want to have a home field advantage, but you don't want it to be just stupid. I get you. And bomb is like smart baseball. The yeah. stuff they do to intimidate opposing teams is smart baseball. Okay. And that's all been created by those people. And a lot of them aren't really high-dollar people. They aren't the kind of people that would give a $10,000 donation to get yeah. football tickets. They decided... 10, 15 years ago, hey, baseball's a good product. It doesn't cost as much. Yeah. I'll put my money in that. And they have become that sort of core group of people that go from behind each dugout all the way behind home plate. Yeah. Those are the people that influence games because they're right well, there in that the infield. Yeah. yeah. Now, you've still got the hog pen, and that's a totally separate issue because right. I don't think that's, that's going to change. That's completely different. That's more of an outfield thing. Yeah. They, they intimidate outfielders, especially your left that fielder left and your fielder, center yeah. fielder. But these are people that, that, inter that, that sort of interfere with pitching of the opposing team, batters, yeah. infield, or whatever. And if those people suddenly all did what they say they're going to do and they're gone, I have no doubt that they will replace them with other people. Yeah. But what they're saying, what those people are saying is, you're going to get new people all right, but they're not going to be smart baseball people. Yeah. They're going to be people with money that are just coming in here because baseball is suddenly a hot property. And they're not going to know about their traditions, and they're not going to be cool like we are. I mean, they may or may not be. It's, you know, you, that, it, we I don't understand know. why they're upset, though. We don't know what will happen. Yeah. That's my whole point. I do understand what these people yeah. are saying. And what the questioner basically, that's the question he posed, is you say it's one Razorback. Yeah. We're all unified here. But you're doing policies here that are done at other places, just bottom line money. Yeah. And it shouldn't just be bottom line money at Arkansas. So there's arguments to be made on both sides. They're this baseball team, as I look at it, is it starting to shape up? They're gonna be loaded again. Oh yeah. So they may be <laughs> as good as they were last year and they may be yeah. poised to win a College World Series at some point in the next few years. So are you gonna stop going to games because of this? That because you got moved out yeah. And you don't sit in those same places. Same seats. I think what if there's a change, what it will be is you will lose some of that intimacy that you yeah. had that made bomb what it was, and it'll just become a loud place. And I don't know if it'll be as good or whatever, but they've made a calculated decision. We're gonna 
we need money. Yeah. This is money to be made. We're not going to undervalue our product anymore. Mm. So you can take it either way, Wh whichever side you yeah. choose to believe. Well, I hope everyone doesn't just up and stop coming to games because of that. But. Because like easy. you mentioned, they're going to be fun it's, to watch. It's easy to say you're going to do that. Yeah, when you come until right it comes down, down to, to it. it. <laughs> Are you really going to do that? All right. Ham Porter asks, from what you have seen or heard during camp, what is your optimism going into the season? And from what you have seen or heard during, oh, yeah, same thing. Yeah. What, yeah. what are your concerns going into the yeah. season? And, and it's the same thing. We talked about it for two or three weeks now. The, the, the optimism comes from the defense. Yeah. And the depth they have on the D-line, the depth they have at linebacker, the depth they have in the secondary. And from going over there and watching the, the little part of practice that we're, we're able to watch, a lot of times, especially, they start indoors and it's 11-on-11. 11 11. Yeah. And a lot of time you have goods versus goods. Now, mm -hmm. they're not tackling. No. But you do see uh, how a running play might develop, how yeah. a pass play might develop. And it just looks like the defense has them covered no matter what. Yeah. I mean, if you do anything offensively, <laughs> you got to work for it. So that's the optimism. And then the, the possible negative is the defense. There's just so many unknowns. Just came back from a Sam Pittman press conference. Mm -hmm. And he's being very cautious about what he says. Yeah. Because he just he admits that when you have – a new starting quarterback, it becomes that quarterback's team. And until mm -hmm. you watch that team play, you don't know for sure. So we got questions of whether K.J. Jefferson can throw the ball effectively. Yeah. Uh, how well can they run the ball? Uh, this whole offensive line is supposed to be bigger and stronger. And, and theoretically, <laughs> more typical of what Kendall Bryles would want. Yeah. But until we see it, we don't know. So that would be the questionable part right there. But offense looks good. We don't know about the defense. Hey, we did get our... I mean, our, defense looks good. We don't know yeah, about the like, offense. Yeah, we got our first depth chart, though, which was exciting today. It, yeah, so it's, and, it'll probably change. And there, there aren't bit. a lot of surprises there. One or two guys won a close battle that maybe you wouldn't think. Yeah. But what that depth part. chart emphasizes to me is they've got depth. If yeah. They, if they got p battles at positions between good players, they didn't that's, have that last year. Yeah. So that's pretty good. Running Razorback wants to know, with Traylon dinged up a little bit, is our receiver depth suddenly an issue? I was going to answer works. this question one way until the press conference. Yeah. Because Sam Pittman had said on Thursday he thought Traylon would be back mm -hmm. today. Yeah. No. Nope. Wednesday maybe, yeah. maybe, not, maybe won't play. Now, he's never disclosed what the injury is. Nope. And we, we don't know. It. We just saw him get up from a play where he stretched out in one of our videos. Yeah. He really stretched out and made a one-handed catch. And then when he got up, he was limping. So maybe he did something to his ankle. I'm not sure. Ankles can be problematic. I'm going to take a guess here. And look, I have no inside information. But I'm going to take a guess here and say that if they were playing Texas this week, he would yeah. play. Yeah, I'd I think agree with they that. probably figure they can do without him, and they want him full speed for Texas yeah. and want to give him another week to rest. They know what he can do, mm -hmm. so I'm going to say he's not going to play. So what does that mean? You suddenly you don't have any receivers. I, I mm. come on, let yeah, me list that's not these the names: <laughs> Trey Knox, Davion Warren, Keetron Jackson, Bryce Stevens, Kendall Catalan, Jalen. Jaqueline Crawford, John David White, Warren Thompson. At one time or another, Sam Pittman said good things about all of Every those guys. Every single one of those guys, yeah. So it looks like they got a lot of depth. Now, is that proven depth? No. No. We'll still have to wait till the game to see if these yeah. guys can do all the stuff that they, that Sam Pittman thinks they can do. But that's a lot of options there yeah. at wide receivers. So I don't think they're going to be in this game – in trouble because Traylon Burks may not play and no, probably won't play. We'll see if Trey Knox kind of returns to his old self in that this game help. against Rice. That would be but nice. <laughs> Warren Thompson, who's the uh, transfer from uh, Florida State, yeah, he's now won a starting position as of now. He moved to the top of the depth chart, one of those receiver yeah. positions. And that guy's good. He was yeah. a four-star out of high school and it has really come in and done very well. So he could actually – sort of take up the slack for trailing. Keetron Jackson, too. I know we're all excited oh, about he's just, him. He's so. looking really good. So, moral but, of the story. But Warren Thompson, okay. <laughs> Warren Thompson is that in that Traylon Burks mold. He's a tall yeah. guy. He can run. He's got speed. You know, he's the four-star out of high school. Yep. So, we'll see. All right. T.L. Slayton has our next question for you, Mike. They want to know, did Sam Pittman say he will use Malik Hornsby in Saturday's game? A two QB system doesn't sound good to me. I liked it last year when we finally had a starting quarterback who only came off the field when he was hurt. I, I can understand where he's coming from. Yeah. Because everybody is still shell-shocked from that 
Russian or that roulette, roulette quarterback, yeah. ru, ru, quarterback roulette, revolving a carousel, door quarterback, just all that stuff. Quarterbacks, that, quarterback, quarterback, quarterback. Yeah. And so I understand what he's talking about. I don't think Sam Pittman is talking about having a two quarterback play most system most right. of the game. Yeah. I think what he's talking about here, and, and by the way, what he said was an answer to a question. He didn't just pop up and say, I'm going to play Malik Hornsby. Right. <laughs> He was asked, would you have a problem? Yeah. The, the actual question was, Rice plays two quarterbacks. Would you have a problem doing that? Mm -hmm. and he said, no, I wouldn't have a problem doing that. And then he proceeded to talk about how much Malik has come along since camp. Yep. And then he ended up saying pretty much, and this is not a quote, but just kind of a paraphrase, if they play him, it will probably be in a sort of a package. Yeah. Like they've come up with a package of plays for him. That's good. And he might come in for a series just yeah. to try out a certain package of plays. Yeah. Because he's different, a different kind of quarterback maybe I a agree. little bit than, than uh, K.J. Jefferson. So uh, it looks we'll like he might him. play, but I'm not. we're not talking about a two-quarterback system. No. I mean, at the end of the day, K.J. Jefferson is the guy right. for Arkansas. All right. Sal Manella, <laughs> interesting name, has our next question. What are the chances Arkansas follows LSU's lead and requires COVID vaccination proof or clean tests for Razorback Stadium games? You know, the Arkansas stated their policy all the way back late last spring, early summer. And, mm -hmm. that, and all they said was full capacity games. Yep. They didn't mention anything about vaccination None proof, anything about taking a test or yep. any of that stuff. And they've never changed that policy. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying to you now is they're not going to do that right no. now. They would, if they were going to, if they had changed their mind about that, we would already know about I it. I agree. Because we're getting too late, too close to the game yeah. to suddenly throw a big surprise on everybody. Hey, everyone, go get a test. Like, I think the, re the reaction to that comes from the fact that LSU did announce they're going to require all that stuff, and I think yeah. that was sometime last week maybe right. when they did that. Since that time, Georgia has come out and said, well, we're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. Here's what I would say about there. I've read some of the arguments on, on social media, and, you know, this always is predictable. That you've got the people that are absolutely convinced that anything and everything is going to cause everybody to die because of COVID, <laughs> and then you've got people that act like COVID is nothing, yeah. and the answer is somewhere in the middle. It is serious, mm -hmm. but you got to look at the facts, and I've said this over and over on this show. The data from the CDC going all the way back over a year ago suggests that COVID does not spread outdoors now, that doesn't mean it can never happen, but it largely spreads indoors, not yeah. outdoors, and that's why I think they're not as concerned. It's not yeah. that they, they do know the number of cases is on the rise in Arkansas, and they understand that, but I think they feel like that's, it's not going to come. There's enough people already vaccinated, and yeah. then they're not going to get spreading going around in an outdoor game where there's a lot of airflow and sunlight hits the hits the stadium and kills a lot of this coronavirus yeah. that's in the air and things like that. So, uh, again, Georgia is not requiring it. I'm going to guess and say most schools aren't going to do it because here's the problem. And I'm not going to comment on the rightness or wrongness of this. The fact is there are people that are so against vaccination or being told that they have to have a vaccination that I'm convinced that if they stated that policy, they would lose some fans. Oh, yeah. I don't know how many. No, I, I fully agree with that. Yeah, I think there's they enough would. people out there that would just, this is a fairly conservative state, yeah. and I think they would just go, we're not coming. And the U of A doesn't want that. No. They need as much money yeah. as they can get. And again, I, I, as I've said, I don't think they feel like they're going to risk spreading. There's not going to be a super no. spreader thing because I of this game it. because it's outdoors. Yeah, and, and I highly doubt that Arkansas would suddenly change their mind this right late. now. Yeah. So, all right, Blood Red Hog says, a recent article in Best of Arkansas Sports argues it is possible Traylon Burks could end his career as the greatest wide receiver in Arkansas history. Do you think this could happen, and do you think Burks will turn pro after the season? You know, what you're talking about when you say greatest in the history, yeah. that, that, that's so it's subjective. a lot to live up to. It's so subjective. <laughs> and there are some things that are obvious when you do that. If you ask who's the greatest running back in Arkansas, everybody would say d -Mac. Right. He just has so much in the record book and did so much in the three years. Yep. He's it. But when you start talking about wide receiver, uh, I would say, first of all, go look at the record book. Uh, yeah. Traylon Burks is listed in one category in the record books, and that is he is third right now in the most receiving yards at a game at 206. 
Kobe Hamilton and Jarius Wright are ahead of him, so he might break that record if he yeah. had a super game of 325 yards yeah. receiving. <laughs> And if he had a, just an unbelievably great season, uh -huh. maybe some people would say, okay, he was the greatest ever. But look, here's what you're talking about. You're talking about guys like Anthony Lucas, Joe Adams, Chuck Dykus, Derek Russell, Lance Allworth. So is Burks better than all of those guys? Some people, because they live maybe. in the current time and they just, everything is right in front of them, and yeah. that's, they'd probably say yes. Yeah, but I mean, you but can when argue you take, if you anyway. talk about people that know who those receivers were, right. Then you can't say that. Yeah. But you could say anything you wanted. You could say right. he's the greatest. Again. What does that really mean? Yeah. It's just. All, all we want is to see some awesome catches yeah. from him this season. And now again, <laughs> if he had, you know, 1,400 yards in receptions, and I don't think any of us would be mad about then it. Then people would say, yeah, he ended up being the greatest yeah. ever. But we got to see that happen first. <laughs> all right, Lanny wants to know, Mike, do you think the captains, or what do you think of the captains on this year's team? Okay, I think we've got a graphic that shows the captains. If we could pop that up, I think we have it. Maybe yeah. we don't. I uh, okay. haven't seen it yet. But um, Grant Morgan, yeah, Grant Morgan, Jalen Catalan, My Catalan, Myron Cunningham, those are no-brainers. The surprise to me was Joe Fouché. Yeah. Now, at that press conference, Sam Pittman said he was the only one of them that got it. They each got up and made a little speech about yeah. they were selected by their teammates. He said, Joe Fouché was just bowled over. I love it. And he it. said, there's a hell of a story behind that guy, a hell of a story behind yeah. him. And uh, he said, that was just a great thing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a little bit of a surprise. They left Traylon Burks off, and he's their best player. Yeah. Does your best player have to be a team captain? No, no. That's a little bit of a surprise. But by the same token, what I think is interesting is that K.J. Jefferson was picked as a captain, and yeah. this isn't coaches picking him. This is it's players. It's players. So that tells me that those players have that much faith in him that he's going to lead the, the yeah. offense. So I saw that as a good sign. So I, I have no issues with these names. I, I like the fact that Fouché was picked. Mm -hmm. It's a great story, and yeah, I like the I fact it. that they show, they're show they showing faith in their quarterback, even though he's a yeah. sophomore and the rest of those guys are upperclassmen. But mm -hmm. uh, I think it's good. Yeah. I don't have any it, issues it, with it. Because just from our experience with KJ, doesn't he seem kind of like a little soft-spoken, I guess? Yeah, he's, 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 one of, he's, he's going to have to lead by example. Yeah, exactly. But we don't know what he's like around the team. Right. We only know what he's like around us. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Razor. But what's his name now? Kenneth, Kenneth, by the way. Fun fact. <laughs> KJ is Tell Kenneth. Tell story. <laughs> so, who was it? Was it Davion Warren that he was yes. playing with? They were playing uh, ping, ping pong. pong. And uh, I guess KJ was beating Davion Moore and then Davion threw his paddle down and said, I refuse to lose to some guy named Kenneth, <laughs> which is just fantastic. That was a great so story. We are forever calling KJ Jefferson Kenneth. Kenneth. So that's who we're referring to. But let's move on. Our next question is from Razorback Redneck who asks, could you explain Kendall Bryles basic offensive philosophy? After last year, I still don't have a good feel for what he wants to do with the ball. You know, it's interesting because there was a a thread started on Hogville by a guy, guy named, uh, what's his name, Muskogee Hog, right? Mus Muskogee Hog fan. Mm -hmm. He, he, he uh, submits some questions to us from time to time. Yeah. And it's usually X's and O's type stuff. He's really right. interested in X's and O's. But he started a thread about this, and I thought he was pretty much dead on. Hmm. As simply as I can explain it, Bryle's philosophy, it would be speed on the edges yeah. because speed on the edges spreads the defense out. If you got fast guys over here and fast guys over here, you got to cover them. Yeah. So that just tends to spread your defense yeah. out and then power up the middle because if you're spread here, you're not as strong up the middle. Yeah. And then what you do is you just go back and forth. If they're if you think they're lined up to stop you run it, throw wide. If if they're going to cover your receivers, go up the middle. Like it. And I, I think the feeling is that he didn't really have the offensive line no. and the running game that he needed last year to do that middle up the middle power part. Yeah. So the, the offense didn't really function the way he wants it to. Yeah. And I think those people that are excited about this team offensively are excited about the fact that we may now see that philosophy more mm -hmm. than we did last year, which again is spread them out, force them to cover your wide receivers, then when they, you think they're gonna, they think you're gonna throw it, pow! You hit them up the middle and run over them. So well, hopefully, we see we'll more see, of that. See if this that season. happens. It sounds good, but you yeah, gotta do it great. in the game. In theory, all right. <laughs> Mouse Town says Frank Broyles ran off some top coaches on his watch, like Eddie Sutton, 
Nolan Richardson, Lou Holtz, and Ken Hatfield. I've had people tell me that he did it because he didn't want any of them to exceed his reputation as the top coach ever at Arkansas. Is there any truth to that? That That's was one an of the dumbest theory. message board things. That was, <laughs> it was very popular there, probably in the last five, six, seven, eight years that Frank was the head coach, mm -hmm. or oh, I'm sorry, was the athletic director. You read that a lot from people that claim to know. I was around Frank Broyles as much as anybody. I can tell you that's total nonsense. Okay. He wanted Arkansas to win national championships in every sport because Frank was all about how do we get more people to the games because yep. if we get more people to the games we got more money we can pay our coaches better. Everything was all about it's like run it as a business. Right. You know and you don't run a business by telling people we don't want to be too good. Yeah. We just want to be <laughs> sort of good. Uh, the best example I can think of is John McDonald. If he was, mm -hmm. if Frank was really jealous about other people winning national championships, Why he would have he let do? John McDonald go to Oregon because right. he could have at any point. And he kept him here all these years, all those years, winning all those national championships. And there was never any jealousy on the part of Frank. Mm -hmm. Frank won one national championship. John McDonald won 40. Yeah. I never heard Frank go, oh, dude, oh, that's no. not good. You know? <laughs> and... If you look at each one of those people that he supposedly ran off, the, the one that he, well, he fired Lou Holtz. But Lou, you just would have, I've talked about him a lot on this show. You just have yeah. to be around him. He was high maintenance. He's hard to deal with. He insulted boosters. He insulted people in the athletic department, other coaches and other sports. He was just a guy that didn't get much sleep. He was an insomniac, and it made him hard to be around. And if you look at Lou's whole career, everywhere he went, he stayed a few years and was successful, and then he Moved got on. run off because people got tired of him. Mm -hmm. And he, he had gone downhill. He had reached a point where he was starting to lose the better in-state players to Oklahoma. And when Frank asked around, he got told by the high school coaches, we don't like this guy. He's unfriendly. Yeah. So when you lose your recruiting base in-state, you're going to be gone. And that was largely, there were some other issues, but I have always thought that was the main one. Um, Eddie Sutton is real simple as a drinking problem. And yeah. Frank didn't want Eddie drinking because there, were, there was evidence that he'd done it on the job two or three times and he didn't want that to happen. He was worried about him having an accident somewhere. Mm -hmm. So he was just went to him and said, you gotta, you gotta go to the Betty Ford Center and you know, Eddie wouldn't do it. Yeah. But he didn't fire him, that's the thing. He didn't run him off. He right. just was insisting that he get help. Did Eddie leave because of that? I think he did because I think he realized that if he didn't do something, he would eventually be fired, but he got the offer to Kentucky, yeah. went there, and then he eventually did get fired there. So I don't think you can blame, blame that on no. Frank. The only one of those that, that I will blame on Frank was Nolan. Yeah. And that was all about Nolan. His coaching was fabulous. The boosters were mad at Nolan because they felt like he should just coach and shut up about other issues. But yeah. Nolan, he was a crusader. He didn't feel like there were enough uh, people in the uh, academic administration who were African American, not enough people in the athletic department. He wanted more coaches around the country. At that time, the number of black coaches in basketball and football had gone way up since oh, Nolan's yeah. day. But when you back, went back to when he was complaining about this, Really, you had largely time. college athletics, which the athletes were largely African-American, and there were almost no African-American head coaches, and that's what he was saying. Yeah. So these people wanted Nolan not to talk about that. He said it made, they said it made Arkansas look bad, would eventually hurt recruiting, and I think Frank sort of listened to him, and he shouldn't have, and that's the one mistake he made. But for every mistake that Frank made, he probably got about 200 things right. He was a really good AD. Yeah. So there's nothing to that. He didn't want somebody showing him up. He didn't yeah. care about that. Fully, yeah. All right. Uh, Tanner Hogg says, I need to know Coach Sam Pittman's middle name for child naming purposes. Does anyone know it? Mike Irwin. I have five girls and we're expecting our first son in November. He will absolutely be something Razorback related. You know, I tried because I, I didn't have any way of getting hold of Sam when this first popped up on Twitter. So I tried very hard to go through and look at everything. I looked at, you know, all of it. Wikipedia, yeah. and any kind of <laughs> reference to Sam Pittman on the internet that it ever just hoping there'd be a mention of yeah. a middle name, and I never found it. But before I could, Sam Pittman popped up on Twitter and I think we've got his response. Yeah. And it was, my father's name was Don, so now we know, so yep. I'm Samuel Don, then it would be such a great honor, and he's saying, for him to name yeah. 
his, his firstborn son after Sam, and he said, go hogs. Now, here's the thing. Now we know Pittman's Samuel Don, yeah. right? Okay, now all of a sudden on Twitter they're all saying, well, let's just change his name to the, the Don. The Don. The Don. I like it. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. I don't happen. know if he'll really like that one. But. And, and here's why, because Sam Pittman's not formal like that. In fact, you know, yeah. it was just a couple of weeks ago that he made a point in a press conference of saying, you can call me Sam. Mm -hmm. I won't get mad, and yeah. I'm going to call you by your name. And then ever since then, that's what he's been doing. Yeah. He calls us all by our name yeah. instead of... I love it. You know, he's just so informal. So yeah. I don't think he will ever be the Don. No. He's just, Even he's still going to be nickname, Sam. Though. <laughs> but the, but the, the Don part the is Don. at least interesting to know that. <laughs> it is interesting to know that. Well, Mike, we've got one more question this week. It is from Blood Red Hog. They are back and asking Mike and Tara. It's prediction time. Oh, gosh, I'm included. Here we go. What will be the final score of the Rice game? I got to look in here because I. You put it. No. Here, I got you. I got it here. Yeah. Um, look, I just came back from again from the press conference where Sam Pittman once again talked about Rice being a very deliberate team. Yeah. They try to control tempo. They'll try to hang on to the ball, take as long as they can to score. So when I see a lot of these predictions, especially among fans, and they're predicting things like 55 to 21 and oh. 45 to 19 and all that stuff, yeah, I don't think they're going to score that many points in this game. First of all, I don't think Arkansas's offense is going to do score 55 points. No, I don't think so. So either. I think this is going to be more of a defensive game, and I want to go 28 to 7. Okay. See. Just off the cuff right now, I think Arkansas will probably put up a little more okay. than, than 28. And I do think that we see Rice probably get two touchdowns, don't okay. you think? I mean, that's just my personal opinion. From from, I talked with the voice of the Rice Owls the today. <laughs> and I was learning a little bit more about that team. And, and he convinced they, you they're going to score some no, points. No, but I just think that they've got a lot of guys back. And I, I'm not sure. I just, I like Arkansas's defense. I, I, I love Arkansas's defense. I'm sure we'll see some takeaways for sure. Yeah. Um, maybe we'll see another. I, I just, I think it's going to be a low scoring game. Yeah. And, I, I don't, and 28 be too many. Is a bit. Might be 24, 21 yeah. to 7. Yeah, okay. Well, good predictions. We're, we're going to give our official predictions, though, on Saturday morning before the game right. on our game day show. So be sure to tune in for that. But that's going to wrap it up for this week's edition of Ask White Mike for Mike Irwin. I'm Tara Talmadge. Everyone, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you back here next Monday.